datang di webinar Strategic Foresight for Policy Planning. Perkenalkan, nama saya Desi Visiana dari Puslab Jakarta yang akan memandu jalannya webinar pada, pada siang hari ini. Pertama-tama saya ingin mengucapkan selamat siang dan juga selamat datang kepada Pak Taufik Hanafi, Sekretaris Kementerian PPN Bapenas. Selamat datang dan selamat siang juga kepada Pak Muhammad Irfan Saleh, Kepala PLT Pusatin Renbang Bapenas. Kepada Pak Petra Kakareci, Kepala Pusat Jakarta, kepada para pembicara webinar pada hari ini, Mingke, Laurong, Marius, dan juga Mbak Caca, selamat datang. Dan tentunya selamat siang dan selamat datang kepada Bapak Ibu, para pejabat di lingkungan Bapak Nas. United Nations Global Pulse bekerja sama dengan Pusatin Renbang dan juga Direktorat Pengembangan Koperasi dan UKM Kementerian PPN Bapak Nas dalam kemitraan analitika untuk memperkuat usaha mikro, kecil, dan menengah atau UMKM dalam konteks pertumbuhan inklusif dan juga pembangunan yang berkelanjutan. Dan webinar ini merupakan salah satu rangkaian dari kegiatan untuk memperkenalkan pendekatan strategic foresight dalam perencanaan kebijakan. Sebelum memulai acara, saya akan membacakan beberapa hal yang perlu diperhatikan bersama untuk kelancaran webinar hari ini. Yang pertama, selama webinar berlangsung, kami menyediakan layanan penerjemah untuk Bapak Ibu sekalian, silakan dapat diklik di tombol kanan bawah layar Zoom. The interpretation feature uh, icon on the bottom right of your screen to listen to both English and Indonesian uh, languages. You can answers ada di bawah atau di slido yang juga nanti linknya akan kami bagikan di dalam chat. Baiklah, untuk memulai acara ini, pertama-tama saya akan mengundang kepada Sekretaris Kementerian PPN Bapak Nas. Bapak Taufik Hanafi untuk menyampaikan sambutannya. Kepada Pak Sesmen, kami persilahkan. Oke, okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for uh, to keep you waiting. Uh, very good morning, uh, Finland. So I believe in uh, Finland right, right now is in Helsinki is rain. The weather system, yes, uh, 12 uh, degrees Celsius. Yeah, so. Uh, Madam Minka Mayer, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Lauren, and also, uh, oh, M Mr. Marius. Uh, so I keep uh, looking uh, uh, from my uh, computers, and also, yes, uh, I believe that uh, from Finland is. Uh, uh, three uh, speakers. Yes. And I also visited uh, Helsinki, I think two years ago before, before uh, pandemics. Uh, uh, we had the SDGs evaluation programs. This uh, took place in the Ministry of Education's building at that time, yes. Okay, uh, very good afternoon, Jakarta. Uh, we have uh, Petra. Uh, so you look uh, uh, very fit right now because uh, Jakarta is every day is almost sunny day. Yes, every day is sunny. Day. And uh, Ibu Mariska, our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Irfan Saleh, the head of the data center, uh, Bapanas. And uh, my uh, colleagues uh, from Bapenas is uh, Deputy Minister and also special staff to the Minister, uh, Director, Planners, and Participants. Uh, welcome to the webinar on the strategic foresight for policy planning. I believe this very uh, important uh, topic. Uh, Minister of National Development Planning is, uh, is right now is preparing uh, what we call the long-term and medium-term development plan. Yes, for long-term is uh, 2025 until 2045. For medium-term is uh, 2025 until uh, 25 sampai 2029. Mungkin saya juga bisa share uh, nanti kepada far away from Indonesia is uh, I don't know how many how many thousand uh, kilometers from uh, uh, Indonesia is uh, far away uh, the North Pole yes 
And uh, last week, uh, Minister of uh, National Development Planning, uh, Babanas, organized uh, development working groups, G20 uh, meeting, uh, September 7 to 9 in Belitung Islands, Indonesia. Uh, the meeting was uh, attended by uh, delegations uh, coming from almost 40 countries and international uh, institutions, uh, and also attended by uh, 15, one, five ministers. Yes. I'm uh, very pleased, uh, and on behalf of Minister of National Development Planning, Bapanas, I would like to extend my appreciation to uh, EU uh, delegation uh, is also attended uh, the W uh, the WG uh, G20 meeting uh, for attending development working groups uh, in Belitung, Indonesia. So that is uh, interesting uh, that I want to share with you during the bilateral uh, meeting with the uh, EU. Uh, there, there, there were two important issues being discussed uh, by Indonesia and the EU. First, on the uh, green and blue economy. That's the second issue is uh, energy transition. Yeah. So, I believe the uh, strategic foresight approach is also used. Uh, you know in understanding, exploring, and also identifying important challenges uh, on the areas of blue economy, green economy, and energy transition. Yes, that's what the... So once again, thank you for strong support uh, from EU for the Indonesia G20 uh, presidency. So actually, it's just a couple of days ago, just finished, uh, and uh, thank you. So uh, I also want to report uh, that many of the participants, uh, I think I believe this participant is right now if uh, coming up, yes, is uh, over 100, uh, close to 170, yes. Many of them just finish uh, participating uh, on the workshop on the scenario planning. So just a couple of days ago. So. They uh, attended the scenario planning workshops also for the uh, preparation in formulating, uh, you know, the uh, issues, uh, challenges uh, in the future. So I believe that the uh, strategic foresight also, uh, you know, plays important role in identifying uh, strategics, uh, criticals issues and challenges in the future. So I think this webinar can uh, enrich and complement uh, our approach and expanding our understanding on the role of strategic foresight in preparing long-term and medium-term development plan. So uh, in this opportunity, uh, once again, I would like to express my appreciation to distinguished uh, speakers far away from Jakarta. It's like, you know, it's like we sitting next to uh, the room, not, uh, uh, not ocean, not country, just uh, different rooms. Yes, it's like, uh, you know, I can see you very clear from just, uh, maybe 30 centimeters from my desk. Yeah, this is uh, very close, yes. And uh, I also want to express my, my appreciation to Jakarta Pulse Lab, UN Global Pulse Finland, and Data Center Bapenas for the excellent uh, collaboration in organizing this uh, webinar. So once again, finalists, uh, I wish you all very productive meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Sensmen. Terima kasih banyak, Pak, sudah menyampaikan uh, kata sambutannya. Uh, kami juga mencatat bagaimana nanti mungkin beberapa prioritas dari G20 bisa juga melakukan dengan pendekatan uh, strategic foresight. Terima kasih, Pak Sensmen.
Untuk selanjutnya, saya mempersilahkan kepada Pak Petra Kakareci, Head of Post Lab Jakarta, untuk juga bisa dapat menyampaikan sambutannya. Pak Petra, kami persilahkan. Terima kasih, Bu Desi. Yang saya hormati, Pak Taufik Hanafi. Terima kasih banyak, Pak Taufik, atas... Uh, uh, oh, actually, I wanted to speak first in English, if that's okay. But I uh, just wanted to thank you for your leadership and guidance uh, for Pulse Life Jakarta um, and uh, the progression that we've been able to uh, make, um, and particularly also for the support and leadership of uh, Irfan Saleh, Ibu Tatik, and the team in Pusdatin Renang and also with uh, the Directorate for uh, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, uh, with Padading and particularly with Ibu Chacha. Um, so I'm so happy to see Ibu Chacha also as one of our distinguished speakers, as well as uh, my, uh, my huge appreciation to uh, our other distinguished speakers, Lauren, uh, Minka and uh, Marius. Uh, so much appreciate your uh, inputs and, and taking the time here. If I might continue in Indonesian on some, some notes, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to in, um, express uh, on this occasion. Jadi, uh, Bapak Ibu, terima kasih banyak dan uh, terima kasih juga atas kehadiran Ibu Bapak. Uh, saya lihat ada Pak Rudi yang saya, Pak Rudi, uh, yang saya sangat hormati, Pak Leo Tapobolan juga, dan uh, uh, apresiasi kami bahwa Bapak, uh, Bapak, Bapak juga mau turut meng, uh, menghadiri uh, webinar uh, ini. Nah, seminar atau webinar ini merupakan rangkaian dari kegiatan Pulse Lab Jakarta sebagai wujud dari kemitraan antara Global Pulse dan Bapak Nas dalam menggunakan pendekatan strategic foresight untuk perencanaan kebijakan. Kegiatan ini juga sejalan dengan arahan steering committee di bawah uh, kepemimpinan Pak Taufik Hanafi sekarang dan sebelumnya di bawah Pak Himawan agar Pulse Lab Jakarta beralih dari sekedar pengembangan konsep dan prototip ke pengembangan kapasitas operasional melalui pendekatan-pendekatan yang inovatif tapi juga aplikatif. Nah, semenjak awal tahun ini, tim kami bersama-sama dengan Direktorat PUMKMK menggunakan pendekatan foresight untuk mengeksplorasi skenario-skenario masa depan yang dapat mempengaruhi sektor UMKM di Indonesia dalam 5-20 tahun mendatang, terutama melihat bahwa uh, sektor ini menjadi salah satu kebijakan tulang punggung dalam uh, apa kebangkitan atau penguatan ekonomi pasca pandemi COVID-19. Dari proses ini kami melihat pendekatan foresight ini juga cukup menarik atau sangat menarik apabila bisa diterapkan oleh Bapak Penas untuk sektor-sektor lainnya. Untuk itu webinar hari ini diharapkan dapat memberikan gambaran mengenai bagaimana pendekatan strategic foresight dapat dipergunakan untuk perencanaan kebijakan khususnya untuk Bapak Penas sebagai pengampu perencanaan pembangunan dan uh, sejalan juga dengan apa yang disampaikan oleh Pak Sesmen bahwa uh, 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 kami juga dalam proses penyusunan RPJMN uh, dan R R RPJP ke depan. Nah, uh, dalam hal ini saya, uh, kami berharap bahwa uh, apa yang akan disampaikan bukan saja oleh pakar dari luar tetapi juga oleh Uh, tim uh, yang dipimpin oleh Ibu Mariska uh, dalam penerapan pendekatan future foresight ini uh, dengan masukan-masukan yang diperoleh dari webinar ini akan membantu atau juga uh, mendukung uh, Bapak Ibu dalam pengembangan uh, dan pelaksanaan tugas dan fungsi yang begitu penting bagi masa depan bangsa. Terima kasih sekali lagi dan uh, semoga webinar ini betul-betul bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak Pak Petra atas kata sambutannya. Baik Bapak dan Ibu, kita sebentar lagi akan segera mendengar beberapa paparan dari empat narasumber kita yang hadir luar biasa pada hari ini. Sebelumnya izinkan saya untuk bisa memperkenalkan secara singkat dari uh, empat narasumber hari ini. Yang pertama adalah Ibu Mingke. Uh, Ibu Mingke merupakan Strategic Foresight Specialist dari Postlab Finland yang memiliki beberapa ba banyak sekali pengalaman di proyek-proyek terkait dengan foresight. Kemudian yang kedua ada Pak Marius. Pak Marius merupakan Learning and Transformation Practice Lead dari School of International Futures. Sebagai Global Futurist, Marius juga sudah mengalami banyak sekali beberapa proyek di berbagai sektor terkait dengan future dan foresight. 
beliau juga memiliki fokus di dalam strategic foresight dan juga skenario planning yang tadi mungkin Pak Sesmen juga sempat mention. Jadi beliau uh, sudah memiliki beberapa pengalaman terkait dengan hal tersebut. Yang ketiga ada Pak Laurang. Pak Laurang merupakan senior foresight for policy expert dari European Commission Joint Research Center. Beliau juga memiliki berbagai pengalaman dalam hal foresight, utamanya di lingkungan EU. Yang terakhir, seperti yang tadi sudah disampaikan oleh Pak Petra, kita punya e, Ibu Mariska yang merupakan perencana di Direktorat PUKMK. Mbak Caca sendiri juga terlibat dalam proyek yang saat ini sedang kami kerjakan bersama untuk melihat bagaimana e, future of MSMEs di Indonesia. Baik, untuk memulai webinar hari ini, pertama-tama saya mau mulai ke e, Mingke. Namun sebelum kita uh, persilahkan Mingke untuk bisa menyampaikan presentasinya, saya ingin Bapak-Ibu bisa mengakses slido. Mungkin Angga bisa di-share screen untuk slidonya. Ya, bisa akses di sini. Oh, mungkin sudah ada yang mulai mengisi. Terima kasih. Uh, bisa akses ke slido, kemudian Bapak-Ibu bisa menyampaikan kira-kira hal yang pertama kali muncul di benak Bapak Ibu ketika pertama kali mendengar kata-kata strategic foresight itu apa sih? Mungkin bisa sambil kita melihat hasilnya ada yang bilang future, planning for future, ada juga wah menarik ini leap of faith, ada yang skeptical juga. Kemudian kita ada yang lihat planning for the future, menarik. Cukup banyak yang bilang future ya. Jadi pokoknya strategic foresight sepertinya kita melihat masa depan tuh seperti apa. Kemudian ada juga must be visionary, skenario, vision. Ada juga yang bilang um, limitless, karena mungkin ya kita kalau melihat masa depan tidak terbatas seperti itu. Just development, kemudian ada juga possibility, menarik, mungkin berarti masa depan itu banyak sekali kemungkinan ya, sepertinya kalau misalnya dari masukan seperti ini. Kemudian ada juga analitik, ada forecast. Mungkin nanti kita bisa dengar dari Bu Mingke, apa sih perbedaan antara foresight dan juga mungkin dengan forecast. Oke, okay, kita bisa lihat main, sebetulnya ada planning for the future, accurate future, dan juga shaping the future dengan uncertainty juga. Baik, terima kasih banyak Bapak-Ibu atas Uh, masukannya apa yang pertama kali terdengar, um, um, terpikir kalau misalnya mendengar strategic foresight ini transisi yang pas untuk kita bisa lanjut ke Bu Mingke yang bisa menyampaikan kepada kita kira-kira apa sebetulnya strategic foresight so Mingke would like to go first with you uh, could you share with us what is actually strategic foresight so the floor is yours Mingke Thank you so much, and thank you, Daisy, for uh, for the kind introduction words and also for the other distinguished guests and, and speakers. So let me first take this opportunity as well to really thank you and uh, and saying that we are so honored uh, that we have this partnership together with Bob and us because you've been such a great partner in in the willingness to innovate and to experiment with strategic foresight. I had the pleasure the last few months to kind of facilitate this group of horizon scanners to do this horizon scan for the future of MSMEs. Yes, and I've been really impressed by the, the eagerness to learn and the, the commitment and the dedication of the scanners. And not only the scanners, but actually from, from the broader group of uh, people within Bapanas that have been part of this. So uh, I'm actually really looking forward to the, to the next few months where we kind of uh, work on finalizing this report and at this big launch event in September. But I, I think uh, Mariska will talk a bit more about that as well. And indeed, it's very cold. It's in Finland here. It's not yet like normal uh, uh, <laughs> circumstances, but for sure, all of them have started. So uh, thank you for your sympathies over there. But as I only have a five minute, really short, brief uh, kickoff here, uh, I would delve in straight away, like what is strategic foresight and why do we actually need it today? Um, when talking about strategic foresight, I think it's important to, uh, to think that we make kind of three core assumptions. The first one is that we that there are many, many plausible futures. That's not only- akan terjadi tidak hanya satu versi tetapi ada banyak kemungkinan masa depan yang akan terjadi dan asumsi yang kedua adalah 
skenario ini atau masa depan ini bisa kita pengaruhi dan bahkan kita juga punya tanggung jawab untuk memastikan masa depan yang lebih baik. Selain itu, ini tidak hanya memerlukan pemahaman tentang isu-isu saat ini seperti yang kita lakukan pada horizon scanning, tapi kita juga ingin mengeksplorasi apa saja masa depan alternatif dan juga apa saja dampak dari masa depan alternatif tersebut. Dan satu elemen lain dari strategic foresight adalah bahwa strategic foresight ini juga menantang kita untuk menguji asumsi-asumsi yang mungkin kita miliki tentang masa depan. Karena semua orang tentunya punya asumsi sendiri tentang masa depan. Tetapi dengan strategic foresight kita akan mengeksplorasi masa depan yang kita inginkan dan juga melihat apakah asumsi-asumsi kita itu valid atau tidak. Karena asumsi tentang masa depan ini yaklah yang akan menjadi mempengaruhi apa saja yang kita lakukan sekarang. Jadi singkat saja, strategic foresight adalah suatu pendekatan terorganisir dan sistematis untuk memikirkan tentang masa depan dan juga menjadi basis pembuatan keputusan. Memikirkan tentang masa depan ini juga menjadi bagian dari pembuatan keputusan. Ini bukan hal yang baru sebenarnya, tetapi kita lakukan dengan cara yang terstruktur, komprehensif, dengan pendekatan tertentu di dalam uh, pemerintahan khususnya. Ini adalah hal yang baru. Dan kita ingin mengklaim ruang di mana kita bisa memikirkan secara lebih jangka panjang dan melihat apa saja kompleksitas dan strategi apa yang bisa kita lakukan terkait dengan masa depan. Dan ini seringkali disalahpahami dengan, oh barangkali ini melihat atau menerawang ke masa depan dan ini bukan sebenarnya prinsip dari strategic foresight. Jadi ini bukan forecasting, tetapi sebenarnya forecast yang menjadi uh, konsep yang juga berbeda. Kita tidak bisa memprediksi masa depan ini juga punya keterbatasannya sendiri khususnya di dunia di mana kita berurusan what is actually valuable is the what you want to explore a range of possible futures and what this could actually mean for your uh, for your for you but also for your organization and for the policy actions that you want to take so why do we do need foresight why do we do we need it now well you see that uh, i think we all know that we have this uh this change in the world that is growing quite expansionally uh it's growing more complex and it's really harder to predict but at the same time our current practices of understanding the world is becoming are becoming more obsolete so there is an increasing relevance gap um and this is only increasing while the, the world is becoming more and growing more complex and we see this already but then our own organization and with other organizations as well that these the the our approaches our current approaches really do not match the complexity of the challenges that we have to uh, that we're facing today we're focusing very much on the short term course directions focus on economic optimization and that's not enough we need to to kind of focus on the long term and address the challenges with truly transformative uh, efforts we have to stretch our thinking and that's not an easy task but we really need to overcome that kind of that short-term bias and to, and to, to rethink and reimagine a range of possible futures so that's why we need foresight and luckily our own secretary general of the un has also endorsed and stressed the need for strategic foresight himself in his uh, our common agenda the report of the secretary general he endorsed really the, the use of strategic foresight to move away from this in kind of incremental progress model and to really kind of be able to envision radical different futures and uh, disruptive solutions. He uh, framed this as a wake-up call. We need to use foresight to really move away from the business as usual and to use futures and foresight to really understand that kind of the stark choice here that is between us uh, uh, upon us it's on the one hand we have this breakdown scenario right of this kind of a, a world of permanent crisis uh, marked by deadly pandemics and uninhabitable planet because of climate change and uh, uh, inequalities that are hugely destabilizing foresight is actually and i and i really appreciated that that came up already in that slido 
example, is that it needs to be visionary, right? We want to use strategic foresight to actually move towards the preferred future, to the breakthrough, breakthrough scenario that is actually, uh, yeah, towards an international system that is actually delivering to the people on the planet. So, uh, final words. I think the UN is really seeing this strategic foresight as kind of a pivotal, um, a strategic pivot, uh, where we really want to bring uh, different strategic perspectives together and really questioning our, our current uh, ways of working and our current ways of thinking. So let's, and I think Bapanas has been an excellent partner in doing this already, like take this, like let's take this opportunity, right? And let's take this momentum to actually uh, build upon that and, and, and uh, think about new enough ways of, of uh, doing business and uh, and designing policies. Uh, so I hope I stayed within my uh, limited five five minute uh, talk, and I'll hand it over again to Daisy. But I'm really looking forward to uh, to the other presentations and the um, uh, the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minka. It's a very good uh, start for us to understand more about what is the strategy foresight. And you mentioned it's a wake up call to move away from the business as usual. So now I would like to move to Marius. Now we already understand a bit about what is strategic foresight. I would like to expand a bit and explore why is actually strategic foresight is crucial for policy planning. And maybe if you could share a bit as well, like what are the key elements in applying this strategic foresight in policy planning? So Marius, the floor is yours. Uh, well, colleagues, thank you very much, and it's uh, really wonderful to be with you. Thank you for the kind opening remarks, and uh, we're excited to see that you are showing an interest in deepening your capability for foresight and using foresight within uh, government planning. Um, I am involved with the School of International Futures. As was said, uh, we work around the world um, supporting governments and, and private and public institutions on strategy and policy, specifically thinking about long-term and future generations. And so I'll be speaking from that perspective and maybe touching on some of the work that we're doing with uh, UN Global Pulse as we think about uh, enhancing the foresight capability within the UN system in particular. A, a good starting point is perhaps to uh, mention this uh, creature called uh, chameleon, which of course, I'm sure you, you'll have a similar creature in Africa, we have them. Uh, and they have this unique ability that they are, have the ability to look forward as well as back at the same time. The, their eyes have that uh, unique capability. And so uh, what we learn from this creature is that really, if we are going to be successful in the future, we have to have the ability to look forward as well as back or back as well as forward. Very often, especially as government, uh, we have what we call legacy issues, uh, issues of culture, issues of history, issues of social, uh, embedded social difficulties. And so while we grapple and struggle to address those historical issues, we also have to be visionary. And so this creates this challenge or this tension between hindsight and what we call foresight. Um, very often in government planning units or planning departments, I very heavily on data, and data, by its definition, is historical because we cannot measure the future. We cannot observe the future through scientific means uh, as we study historical uh, data or trends. And so what we tend to do is we develop very, very powerful hindsight, which is information about the past. And then we expect that the future is going to be like the past. And so this is what forecasting is. It's the future, it's the past with bells and whistles, or it's the, it's the past plus 5%. And so this is what Minka referred to as the assumptions that we make about the future, because all our knowledge is in the past. It might be true that we have some individuals in our organization with wonderful hindsight, 20 years of experience, 50 years of, of long-term uh, historical perspective. And it might be true that we have some individuals in the organization with wonderful insight, deep understanding of the current situation. But what foresight does is it shifts the conversation from hindsight and insight, and it adds to them foresight, the ability to think about the future, grapple with what that future might mean, and then formulate strategies and policies for that future. Now, 
uh, Minka also mentioned this idea of the rate of change uh, in a world of large scale disruption, whether it's socioeconomic disruption through inequality, whether it's uh, global pandemics causing economic shocks, uh, shocks in food security, whether it's the emergence of technology, these changes and the combination of these changes are of such a scale and such a speed that our institutions are not changing fast enough. If we're in a, in a formal uh, government institution that is still operating on the technology, the processes, the mindset of 1960, 1980, 2020, but we're in a world where the society is operating on the technology of 2020 and 2025. They're operating on the on future uh, human settlements of 20, 2030, 2040 in the, in the wake of migration and climate shock and, and uncertainties like that. We have to develop an ability as an institution to shift our mindset away from past and think about what is the long-term impact of artificial intelligence? What is the long-term impact of new trade relations in our region, in Asia? What is the long-term impact of shifting culture, shifting values among the youth? And so Foresight offers us a tool, a, a systematic way of thinking about how these disruptions are going to affect us. Now, uh, uh, one of our futurist colleagues uh, out of Australia, Marie Conway, makes the statement that Foresight is really a systematic, and organized way of working with uncertainty, of engaging uncertainty. We cannot predict the future, as Minka said, but we can anticipate the future, or we can anticipate multiple alternative futures and prepare ourselves for those futures. How do we do that? We do that by looking at things like drivers of change on the left-hand side, analyzing what is causing a shift in culture? What is causing the acceleration of technology? We do that by using systems thinking of how these drivers interact with each other. How does politics interact with economics? How does politics and economics at the domestic level interact with politics and economics at the regional level? We use systems thinking to do that. And then we use scenario thinking to bring that analysis into images of the future or stories about the future or scenarios about the future, like the scenarios we did with the Supreme Council of Planning in Oman to think about what is the future of Oman in 2040? What is the future of the oil industry? What is the future of employment in 2040? Now, these tools become very powerful in preparing ourselves to address the, the SDGs. How do we think about the, the future of food when you have 3D printed food, for instance, or, or micro farms in urban centers? How do we think about the future of education? And so we can use these tools not only to understand uncertainty, but to target our thinking, our policy thinking and our strategy thinking across the SDGs. So what is the real value of doing foresight? What foresight does is it helps leaders, policymakers, business leaders, government officials, planners. It helps them manage amidst uncertainty. We're in an environment where uncertainty is high. And because uncertainty is high, it's difficult to make decisions in such uncertainty. And so what strategic foresight does is it helps us make better strategic choices. It helps us build preparedness. What would you have done differently if you knew in 2019 that there would be a global COVID pandemic? Or what would you do differently if you knew that there would be a Ukraine crisis and a, a food uh, crisis associated with that? And so it helps us to develop the sensing network for future preparedness. The third one is it helps us to develop alert organizations. So instead of organizations that meet and have the agenda which talks about the past, which is our annual report, our quarterly report, our five-year report, all of which are about the past. It helps us build organizations that can talk about the future, that have the tools to be alert to what's happening around us, to develop anticipation, awareness, and agility. Now, we at SWAF, at the School of International Futures, we've developed a structured, systematic approach of doing this, from scoping the foresight project we want to do, 
to ordering our analysis in that project, to investigating what are the implications of the foresight, and then to integrating that foresight into our organization. I want to talk for a few minutes quickly about integrating foresight, because this is what becomes really important. Now, as I do that, let me ask you, if you would, in the chat, to answer this question by putting a number in the chat. If you had to rate your government for how prepared is the government currently for the future, what would you say? Is it completely unprepared? Is it somewhere a little bit behind where it should be? Maybe you say it's, start, it's starting to get prepared or making steady progress, or perhaps you feel like fully prepared. How would you rate government currently in terms of its future preparedness? And as you reflect on that, let me quickly talk about integrated futures. There's some wonderful examples around the world of governments that have integrated futures or foresight into their, their public institutions. In South Africa, where I live, uh, we've done that a number of times through civil society, in the Montfleur scenarios, through the government, the presidency doing scenarios. Uh, we've also done that more recently with government, business, and uh, civil society labor together doing a joint participative scenario process uh, called the Indulamiti scenarios. We also see this in countries like Mexico at the city level. Uh, Gabriela Gomez Mont looking at the, the urban experiential labs, looking at the future of cities. Uh, we see this in, in Finland, of course, um, with a, a, a person appointed in the office of the prime minister working with the committee for the future which is, of course, in the parliament, where at the right at the center of government, there's the capacity to think about the long-term future, to talk to leaders in parliament, in the Committee for the Future, about the long-term future, and to involve government departments across the, the, the state in those futures. And then, of course, we see this in sectors, the likes of the World uh, Food Program, uh, the World Economic Forum, as well as the, the World Food Program, and doing scenarios on the future of food. And so we see institutions around the world implementing foresight, embedding foresight. And really what they're doing is they're, number one, they're creating immediate insights. And this is a real opportunity for governments. Choose a policy area. Maybe you're interested in the future of urban mobility in cities. Choose a policy area. Develop immediate insights about the future. Or create incentives and build capacity for foresight in the, in the country. Uh, fund a chair in futures at the university, convene scholars in futures with government, so building that capability in the government. Also create long-term awareness on key risks, such as COVID, et cetera. But most importantly, what I'll finish on is how do we build an ecosystem for foresight? Now, we've done some research about how governments around the world have used foresight. And what our research shows is four things. Number one, you have to do foresight in a way that is contextually relevant, that the response to the social cultural reality of the environment. So Indonesia would need foresight that is fit for purpose in Indonesia. Number two, you have to put the foresight in the right context with regards to how government functions. Is government a monarchy? Is it a democracy? Is it a parliamentary system? And how do we use foresight in that specific system? And then number three, which is the one I want to focus on, we need to think of building a foresight ecosystem. It's not effective when you have one individual somewhere in an office doing foresight and having a foresight report because then no one understands the foresight. No one uses the foresight. We have to build a foresight ecosystem that involves multiple parties, multiple institutions, the Department of Finance, with the Department of Planning, with the business community, together doing participative foresight becomes very, very powerful. And I'll share with you after the session some of the principles of the culture, the structures, the people, and the processes that you can develop in such a foresight ecosystem. And then let me finish by saying, we think that there are four ways in which you can immediately activate your institution to use foresight. Number one, is to connect with practitioners and colleagues who do foresight, as we're doing today. By hosting these kinds of conversations, we share the learning. Number two, raise awareness around future trends with senior leaders. Foresight needs to have sponsorship from the top. 
And so by getting few, uh, senior leaders like the Secretary General in the UN, Antonio Guterres, to become aware of the need to think about futures becomes very powerful in implementing futures across the institution. Number three, discuss these key external trends and drivers among colleagues, create spaces where these conversations can happen. And number four, of course, reach out to those in the UN system as you're doing today, who have these skills, who are available to support. And we, of course, would love to work with you on that. Thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you so much, Marius. Very insightful. I really take a lot of notes, as you mentioned. So there are a lot of benefits that we can take in by integrating foresight into um, our policy planning to build vision, to manage risk, anticipation, awareness, and agility, and how we can actually also apply it by, you know, starting from now, it's we already connect with the practitioners. We're also trying to raise awareness. And I'm glad that uh, earlier in the opening remarks, uh, assessment also mentioned that Actually, Bapman has already started to think about scenario planning. So looking forward for further discussion with you, Marius. A lot of questions already coming in to us. So thank you so much. So before I move a bit to uh, Laurent, I would like to invite the participants. Bapak Ibu, saya mengundang kembali untuk bisa uh, masuk ke slido lagi. Setelah mendengarkan apa yang disampaikan oleh Mingke, kemudian disampaikan juga oleh Marius mengenai strategic foresight dan bagaimana itu bisa bermanfaat untuk policy planning, mungkin bisa di-up untuk slidonya. Saya ingin bisa melihat kira-kira bagaimana menurut Bapak-Ibu dalam hal apa kira-kira pekerjaan Bapak-Ibu dan rekan-rekan semua bisa memanfaatkan pendekatan foresight ini. Mungkin kita bisa up um, untuk slidonya. Ya, jadi mungkin saya bisa minta kira-kira dalam hal apa setelah tadi dijelaskan kira-kira strategic foresight bisa bermanfaat. Saya sudah lihat long term planning, kemudian semakin meningkatkan kepercayaan diri untuk bisa membuat planning, stability, kemudian time frame mapping karena betul di foresight kita bisa melihat mungkin jangka menengah, 5, 10 tahun, 15 tahun, 20 tahun ke depan. Kemudian to be more anticipatory about the future. Kemudian juga ada soal leading dan anticipating seperti apa yang tadi uh, Mario sudah sampaikan. More coming, helping country to anticipate the futures. Very interesting. Kemudian juga ada bagaimana untuk bisa memberikan konteks kira-kira apa yang mungkin kita bisa achieve di uh, kemudian hari seperti apa. Dan juga additional tool for policy making tentunya foresight nanti bisa dikombinasikan dengan beberapa metode lainnya yang tentunya sudah dijalankan oleh Bapak Penas. Terima kasih banyak. Ini justru menjadi bridging kita untuk kemudian kita bisa diskusi selanjutnya untuk mendengarkan dari Laurang mengenai kira-kira, maybe Laurang, um, now we already understand the strategic foresight, what is the benefit of us integrating it into policy planning. Now I would like to expand a bit again from your perspective. Maybe you can share with us the practical uh, use case or the example to apply strategic foresight in the context of policy planning. Maybe also you could give some examples how you apply foresight in the Euro European Union context. So the floor is yours, Laurent. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen quickly. Yeah. So we can move this. Here, okay, that's probably better. So, so thank you very much uh, for having me writing me uh, today to this seminar. Um, I am very grateful. Um, and the first two presentations by Mink and, and Barius have been explaining very well what foresight is, you know, and how best to use foresight. Um, so I'm going to try and explain to you in one example, you know, how this can look like in, in a real case. So I'm coming from the European Commission Joint Research Center, which is one of the biggest directors general of the European Commission, which is spread across um, five countries uh, in the EU, and it has about 2,000 researchers. And we're a small group of about 17 people doing foresight there uh, in Brussels. <clears throat> and we've been doing foresight in the commission for a long time. So to, to really give a very short overview of the history of foresight in the EU system, 
uh, the first trace I could find of uh, a body in the new institutions actually doing foresight was in 1987 with um, a body in the European Parliament called the Science and Technology Options Assessment Office, where people were doing essentially technology foresight. And in 1989, the president of the European Commission created the foresight cell, you know, the Cellule de Prospective, that was Jacques Delors at the time, who wanted to have socioeconomic insights to feed these policies, which were really oriented towards the future. And at the same time, a friend of his who was working also at the, at the GRC and the Joint Research Center said, yes, but we are in a very technological world. So if we have socioeconomic foresight for policy, we should also have technology foresight for policy. And so they also created this Institute for Prospective Technological Studies in the GRC in 1989 to really look at all these questions of uh, technology foresight. After that, um, there were changes in, in, in governance. Uh, there were new people who came in who did not have this foresight culture. And then for a few years, Foresight was maybe less used in the in the institution, but by 2010, you know, foresight had come back with, with force, and then there was the creation of the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System by the European Parliament, which was an inter-institutional EU network to really discuss global trends and how global trends could in, uh, influence the future of the EU. And so that, you know, launched again this culture of foresight in the EU institution. And um, by 2013, you know, uh, foresight activities at the GRC had moved then from ISPA, from the Italian side, and, and Seville, you know, back to, to Brussels. It started to raise its profile. And the Director General for Research started to fund foresight research, you know, using uh, the, the multi annual framework program for research of the European Union. So that really said, you know, the, or prime the pump, let's say, and, and fed the activities. And by 2017, we were created, you know, we at the GRC, the Competent Center on Foresight, where we started to actually do a lot more, you know, visible uh, projects on demand for policy at the EU level. By 2019, you know, one of the commissioners and even a vice president of the commission was given in its mission letters a role in strategic foresight. So that was really a milestone. They gave a lot of political visibility to strategic foresight. And then since 2020, we started to produce annual strategic foresight reports. And at the same time, following this new initiative in the Commission, a number of foresight services were created in the European Council, in the Economic and Social Committee, and in the European Committee of the Region. So you have a dynamic that was created to actually include foresight in policy thinking across the board of all EU institutions. And then in 2021, you know, the vice president started to animate this uh, government foresight network at, uh, across all the member states of the European Union. So in a nutshell, that's, you know, the long history of foresight for policy uh, in the EU. Um, so building on what uh, the previous speaker said, you know, I think a few key points emerged already, you know, that show what it takes to have good quality foresight for policy. And one of the first points is to actually involve the decision makers, you know, uh, in the foresight and make sure to define the scope of the foresight project with them, you know, to really give uh, foresight this strategic nature, uh, where, which is what it needs to actually have the most impact. I think another important point is to be able to work in foresight with all the relevant stakeholders to be able to establish the legitimacy of the outcomes of the foresight process, because everybody's been part of this. And that actually increases the capacity to also influence decisions afterwards. You know, if everybody has been part of the discussion, everybody has been this, building this collective intelligence about the future, then it's easier to use the results of foresight. Using structured methods, yeah, I think the, the School of International Futures, you know, really made that point. You know, we, we have a strong toolkit and we have to actually make sure that we use it and we use it well. Um, when we went to do foresight for policy, we've discovered that it's also important to coordinate, you know, with the political calendar. Uh, so the reflection exercises, the results of the foresight, you know, have to be coherent with the moment when decisions or key discussions in policy are taking place to have the maximum influence. And also because foresight can be a bit abstract and sometimes uses some jargon, 
we have to make an effort to adopt the political language to really communicate what we what we learn from Paul Fett will well impact the minds of decision makers. And then, of course, foresight is something that requires you know, homework. So we have to invest in the evaluation of the results. So when we've done an exercise, you know, look back at it. You know, what did we do right? What did did we do wrong? You know, and uh, learn from from uh, from past experience. And also make sure that we do the homework in terms of data collection, you know, production of knowledge, analysis of all the discussions that are taking place in foresight processes. Two important points um, that were made also very quickly in the previous uh, presentation. Foresight is no prediction. Sebelum, in... Sebelumnya, foresight ini bukan prediksi dan bukan forecast, bukan perakiraan. Saya rasa poin yang penting juga adalah bahwa foresight adalah suatu bentuk intelijensi kolektif. Bahwa foresight ini bukan sesuatu yang dilakukan satu orang saja di kantornya sendirian. Jadi, ini dilakukan secara kolektif dengan melibatkan semua stakeholder. Karena pada akhirnya keputusan yang dibuat, kalau kita membuat keputusan dan tidak ada yang terlibat, maka tentunya ini tidak akan bisa berhasil. Jadi kita harus memasukkan input dari semua pihak. Foresight yang baik memerlukan waktu dan freedom atau kebebasan. Ini kita harus punya fleksibilitas agar pikiran kita ini tidak dibatasi dan eksplorasi kita tidak dibatasi. Metode dan metode-metode yang digunakan juga uh, akan saya bahas nanti di presentasi saya. Dan itu poin lain yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah bahwa seringkali perencanaan skenario ini bisa menghasilkan skenario yang baik dan juga mengembangkan format-format yang lebih singkat. Jadi menggunakan sesi-sesi yang singkat misalnya dalam beberapa jam saja kita bisa melakukan sesi refleksi. Jadi ini adalah serangkaian tool dan alat yang kita gunakan untuk perencanaan skenario. Ada scenario planning, horizon scanning juga salah satu metode yang digunakan. Jadi ada banyak sekali metode-metode dan alat untuk foresight. Jadi ini adalah overview dari foresight yang digunakan di dunia nyata untuk menetapkan keputusan dari Uni Eropa. Tahun 2018 dirayakan... 50 tahun Customs Union di sana dan selama 50 tahun ini mereka merasa bahwa ada banyak hal yang berubah di dunia ini menjadi semakin kompleks jadi kita memerlukan refleksi jangka panjang untuk memastikan bahwa kita memasukkan perubahan-perubahan ini ke depannya jadi pada saat itu Direktur Jenderalnya mencoba Uh, untuk mengumpulkan para anggota-anggota dan pemikir dan think tank. Lalu mereka juga meyakini bahwa mereka butuh lebih banyak dari yang mereka butuhkan dan akhirnya uh, bisa membawa kebijakan Customs Union ke level selanjutnya. Jadi kami bekerja sama dengan Customs Union Kita juga ada beberapa kegiatan-kegiatan selama satu tahun. Jadi kita mulai tahun 2019, bulan Februari, untuk pemetaan sistem. Jadi apa saja customs di Uni Eropa, apakah mereka sudah memahami semuanya. Jadi kita lakukan pemetaan dulu. Jadi sistem-sistem yang kita lihat, saat ini yang sedang berjalan kita petakan dulu lalu juga apa saja siapa saja stakeholdernya dan juga ekspertis atau keahlian mereka apa saja selain itu kita dan horizon scanning dan juga memasukkan proses foresight dengan informasi solid sebanyak mungkin ya. Jadi uh, 
di sini kita juga sudah mengembangkan so, And 
in this who should do what in terms of you know the actors, commercial actors, in terms of the commission, you know, the policy members and the member states, uh, national customs office, everybody. So you know, we could highlight you know the, a real concrete path forward distributing the roles for each of the stakeholders involved in the policy making process to actually achieve that vision. Something very applied and very practical. And then of course that allowed us to build on the foresight process to push the reflection further, you know, in terms of the customs union and put policy making into a long-term perspective, which is very often difficult to achieve because there is such a pressure from the present. That's all I wanted to say with you. Uh, sorry for having been a bit long and, and complex. Any question you might have, I'm ready to answer. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Laurent. There are a lot of notes as well uh, that, I uh, that I took related to foresight and uh, the examples that you put in the future of customs, how actually that process of um, uh, apply really real thinking and putting it into the vision and how we can make a, a roadmap to achieve the vision, it's really interesting. And there are also a couple of questions that are already coming in that later I would like to ask to you as well related how we can apply this. So uh, thank you so much again for, for sharing with us. Um, so before um, I open for open and questions, we still have one uh, distinguished speakers with us, Mbak Caca. Tapi sebelum ke Mbak Caca, tadi kita sudah melihat Bapak dan Ibu mengenai konteks uh, future and foresight, kemudian bagaimana itu bisa diimplementasikan ke dalam kebijakan uh, publik dan bagaimana kemungkinan itu bisa uh, di, diaplikasikan. Sebelum uh, kita nanti lebih banyak diskusi, saya mungkin sekarang mau masuk lebih ke konteks Indonesia. Sebelum kita mempersilahkan Mbak Caca, saya akan meminta kembali sekali lagi Bapak-Ibu untuk mengakses ke Slido sebelum kita masuk ke konteks Indonesia. Bisa tolong di-up. Dengan melihat bagaimana um, foresight kemudian bisa diaplikasikan ke dalam pengambilan kebijakan, saya mungkin sekarang mau bertanya kepada Bapak-Ibu, kira-kira bagaimana kita melihat Indonesia 20 tahun mendatang? Kira-kira apa yang uh, Bapak-Ibu kemudian, tadi kan mungkin kalau kita melihat ke depan, kita ngomongin soal foresight, kira-kira dalam satu kata 20 tahun ke depan Indonesia itu seperti apa? Resilient, menarik. Indonesia emas. Ada lagi mungkin yang ingin menyampaikan consumer adaptif apakah mungkin uh, apa sebagai uh, apa kita semakin uh, konsum, mungkin konsumerismenya semakin tinggi ya resilient yang cukup banyak kemudian adaptif develop ada yang bilang juga automation ada yang sangat optimis dengan kita bisa mencapai green and sustainable Indonesia developed Cukup banyak yang bisa menja yang menjawab 20 tahun dari sekarang Indonesia akan oh green green juga dan selain resilient kemudian juga ada yang implementing rule of law uh, kemudian juga ada many possible future crowded sekarang saja sudah crowded ya jadi mungkin 20 tahun lagi uh, Indonesia semakin crowded terima kasih banyak Bapak Ibu silakan kalau masih mau melanjutkan kira-kira membayangkan 20 tahun lagi Indonesia seperti apa dan sekarang saya mau transisi ke Mbak Mariska yang kebetulan uh, sudah melakukan mengadopsi bagaimana pendekatan uh, strategic foresight bisa dimanfaatkan di lingkungan Bapenas dalam konteks MSMI atau UMKM Mungkin Mbak Caca, saya mengundang Mbak Caca untuk bisa cerita uh, bagaimana kemudian di Direktorat PUKMK Forsat sudah diaplikasikan dan kira-kira perbedaannya dengan yang biasanya dilakukan oleh Direktorat PUKMK itu seperti apa? Karena tadi di awal Mingke menjelaskan ini di luar bisnis as usual, jadi mungkin pengen dengar juga cerita dari Mbak Caca seperti apa. Silakan Mbak Caca. Ah, baik, terima kasih Mbak Desi. Uh, yang saya hormati Bapak Sesmen uh, Bapak Nas, uh, Bapak Kepala Sedatin uh, Rembang, Pak Ivan Saleh, uh, dan Head of uh, Postcard Jakarta, Bapak Petraka uh, Kareci. Uh, Bapak-Ibu speakers dan peserta webinar lainnya. Uh, izinkan saya menyampaikan materi dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, pada kesempatan kali ini, saya akan menceritakan sedikit um, secara singkat mungkin ya pengalaman kami dalam melakukan strategic foresight dengan, uh, dengan metode horizon scanning pada proses perencanaan kebijakan UMKM. Slide saya udah jalan belum? Sorry. Uh, belum jalan. 
masih slide yang pertama Mbak Caca. Oke, okay. oke okay, uh, maaf ya. Mungkin uh, sedikit overview uh, project collaboration kita. Uh, kami di Direktorat Pengembangan UMKM bersama dengan Pusdat Tien Renbang dan Pusdat Jakarta ini memiliki kemitraan uh, analitika uh, yang uh, bertujuan untuk memperkuat usaha mikro kecil menengah atau UMKM dalam konteks pertumbuhan inklusif dan berkelanjutan. Kemitraan analitika ini kami mulai uh, inisiasi di pertengahan tahun 2021 dan rencananya akan berakhir di akhir tahun 2022. Nah, uh, dua kegiatan utama dari kemitraan analitika ini yang pertama adalah uh, pembangunan dashboard uh, da dashboard analitika data UMKM yang nantinya akan uh, dapat menampilkan data-data UMKM uh, dalam bentuk spasial dan juga analitikanya. Nah, yang kedua adalah uh, studi strategic foresight dengan menggunakan metode horizon scanning. Studi ini bermaksud untuk mengeksplorasi faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi masa depan UMKM di Indonesia. Tadi sudah banyak dijelaskan oleh pembicara sebelumnya mengenai strategic foresight. Uh, nah, mungkin uh, saya refresh sedikit kalau di uh, di dalam konteks uh, perencanaan kebijakan UMKM ini, kami memang menggunakan metode horizon scanning. Jadi horizon scanning ini adalah uh, merupakan uh, salah satu alat utama dan juga uh, proses awal di dalam strategic foresight. Nah, karena memang tujuan kami tadi adalah ingin mengeksplor isu dan perkembangan yang berpotensi uh, mempengaruhi masa depan UMKM, maka selanjutnya yang dilakukan adalah proses pengumpulan data ataupun bukti untuk mengidentifikasi potensi peluang dan hambatan tadi yang dapat mengubah landscape UMKM di masa depan. Lalu horizon scanning ini merupakan proses yang yang cukup terstruktur karena ini juga nanti akan mencakup data study, literature review, kemudian ada survei dan wawancara dengan para pakar dan juga uh, fokus ke discussion. Lalu, uh, mengapa kami melakukan studi foresight dengan metode horizon scanning? Uh, horizon scanning, the foundation of strategic foresight, the aim is to stimulate forward thinking and um, thereby enhancing strategic decision. Depan atau uh, forward thinking. Gitu. Jadi ketika kita berpikir jauh ke depan, semestinya kita akan dapat membayangkan berbagai skenario di masa depan, uh, dan ini juga akan meningkatkan kesiapan kita akan masa depan. Gitu. Dan uh, pada akhirnya nanti kita diharapkan dapat mengambil keputusan yang jauh lebih strategis dan lebih baik. Secara khusus, tuj uh, studi ini bertujuan untuk Uh, memahami apa uh, perkembangan potensi yang dapat mempengaruhi masa depan UMKM dalam 5 sampai 20 tahun ke depan. Kemudian juga uh, membangun kapasitas SDM khususnya memang di direktorat kami ini untuk uh, memahami lebih mengenai strategi foresight melalui proses learning by doing dan untuk memberikan input atau masukan bagi rencana pembangunan jangka panjang nasional dan uh, rencana pembangunan jangka menengah nasional untuk uh, lebih mendukung ketahanan UMKM uh, secara jangka panjang. Uh, lalu seperti pada penelitian uh, pada umumnya uh, yang mungkin memang ada research question di dalam studi uh, foresight ini kami juga punya uh, key question yaitu uh, Perkembangan apa sih yang dapat mempengaruhi masa depan UMKM dalam 20 tahun ke depan? Ini adalah proses yang kita lalui. Tadi seperti yang saya sudah sebutkan bahwa proses horizon scanning ini sangat sistematis dan dan terstruktur. Jadi ini adalah timeline-nya dapat dilihat. Studi foresight ini kami mulai di bulan April 2022 yang difasilitasi oleh uh, Close Lab Finland, diawali dengan workshop pengenalan strategic uh, foresight dan horizon scanning. Uh, kami mengucapkan terima kasih, thanks to Minke dan tim. Kemudian setelah workshop, ini dibentuk tim yang terdiri dari 12 orang scanners yang dibagi ke dalam tiga kelompok, yaitu kelompok po uh, politik dan hukum, kelompok sosial ekonomi, dan kelompok uh, teknologi dan lingkungan. 
uh, dalam setiap proses uh, horizon scanning ini selalu dipandu oleh pakar dari uh, Poster Finland. Proses selanjutnya adalah mengidentifikasi berbagai sumber informasi yang terpercaya untuk mendapatkan uh, atau menangkap sinyal dan tren uh, di masa mendatang. Lalu masing-masing grup scanner uh, uh, juga uh, perlu menentukan pakar yang akan diinterview serta melakukan peer review sumber informasi atau media yang tadi berhasil dikumpulkan. Proses scanning dan pengumpulan informasi ini dilakukan melalui manual scan pada media-media yang tadi berhasil dikumpulkan dan juga melalui interview pakar. Dalam prosesnya juga ada check-in rutin yang kami lakukan bersama dengan PLF dan PLJ untuk apa ya mungkin lebih berdiskusi mengenai bagaimana kesulitan atau tantangan yang kami hadapi dalam mengumpulkan informasi sinyal dan tren tadi. Selanjutnya dari hasil scan yang berhasil dikumpulkan ini dilakukan filtering untuk mengidentifikasi sinyal-sinyal yang yang kami rasa paling relevan berdasarkan kriteria seperti uh, kebaruan, kemudian dampak dan kemungkinan. Nah, uh, yang terakhir ini nantinya uh, oh kemudian kami juga setelah uh, apa mengumpul filtering tadi melakukan serial uh, fokus group discussion yang melibatkan berbagai tokoh dan juga pakar untuk memvalidasi hasil temuan kami dan mendiskusikan mengenai implikasinya terhadap masa depan UMKM. Nah, terakhir uh, nanti akan ada report atau uh, laporan akhir horizon scanning. Uh, saat ini kami masih dalam proses penyusunan report tersebut. Nah, mungkin uh, saya ingin uh, share beberapa aktivitas kunci dalam perjalanan horizon scanning kami. Jadi, uh, di, di dalam uh, studi foresight ini ada 12, uh, ada dedicated scan team yang terdiri dari 12 scanners, 7 orang dari direktorat kami, pengembangan UKM dan kooperasi, dan juga 5 orang dari PLJ. Ini karena uh, kami menyadari memang uh, kurang masih ada keterbatasan uh, apa uh, SDM juga di, di lingkungan kami sehingga kami masih membutuhkan juga dari PLJ dan memang sistemnya uh, learning by doing jadi kita belajar sama-sama terima kasih untuk tim PLJ juga yang sudah berdedik, uh, berdedikasi ikutan uh, dalam scanning dan juga uh, memfasilitasi semuanya kemudian uh, ada interview juga yang kami lakukan bersama 24 pakar dan melakukan empat serial uh, MGD bersama dengan 22 pakar. Dari hasil scanning yang pertama ini, kami mengidentifikasi ada 40 topik area dengan kurang lebih 115 sinyal. Kemudian setelah kami pertajam lagi melalui FGD tadi, lebih dikerucutkan menjadi 20 tematik area dengan 45 sinyal yang lemah itu yang berpotensi yang kami anggap mungkin belum ter, belum dilihat selama ini belum ditangkap oleh oleh pengambil kebijakan, tapi kami anggap ini berpotensi dapat mengaruhi masa depan UMKM di Indonesia. Lalu bagaimana um, kaitan strategi foresight dan horizon scanning ini dalam proses penyusunan perencanaan pembangun, uh, pembangunan jangka panjang nasional? Uh, mungkin secara personal saya juga uh, belum pernah terlibat langsung dalam penyusunan FPJPN sebelumnya sebelum yang sekarang gitu. Nah saya juga mungkin yakin di sini banyak teman-teman bapak ibu yang uh, mungkin belum pernah mengalami atau terlibat dalam penyusunan FPJPN sehingga kami merasa cukup beruntung uh, di direktorat bisa uh, apa namanya ketika masa-masa penyusunan pekerja di ini juga kami dibarengi dengan study uh, foresight uh, yang Tentu saja nanti hasilnya bisa memperkaya uh, background tadi dan uh, RPJM, RPJPN kami. Secara garis besar, framework background tadi kami adalah sebagai berikut, dan nanti uh, hasil dari studi foresight kami akan uh, dimasukkan ke dalam uh, nomor 4 dan 5. Ini akan menjadi masukan yang berharga untuk mengantisipasi isu-isu strategis UMKM dan kooperasi yang mungkin muncul di masa mendatang. Kemudian juga nanti ketika kita berhasil mengidentifikasi isu-isu strategisnya, nanti kita melihat, kita ingin menghasilkan rekomendasi kebijakan yang lebih tepat sasaran dari UMKM. Kemudian ini adalah reflection proses dari dari horizon scanning yang sudah kita jalani selama ini. Mungkin kami tidak bermaksud untuk membandingkan baik atau buruknya ataupun negatif positifnya dari metode-metode yang pernah kami lakukan sebelumnya dengan horizon scanning. Uh, namun saya ingin lebih memperlihatkan dan akan mengenai uh, prosesnya. Biasanya kalau di direktorat kami dalam konteks uh, perencanaan UMKM ini 
melakukan kajian termasuk background study mungkin sebelumnya kemarin-kemarin ada RPJMN ini uh, biasanya lebih bersifat konvensional kami melakukan literatur review the study kemudian juga berbagai uh, uh, FGD bersama pak pakar uh, bersama akademisi dan juga banyak stakeholder lainnya kemudian yang kedua juga kami melihat uh, belum ada keseragaman metode dalam suatu kajian. Jadi begitu, uh, begitu juga mungkin di unit-unit kerja lain di Bapenas yang mungkin menggunakan metode yang berbeda-beda, baik itu uh, mungkin kuantitatif, kualitatif, ataupun mix method. Nah, uh, yang ketiga adalah satu hal yang juga yang kami sadari ini terkadang kami tidak inklusif dalam melihat isu dan permasalahan dalam konteks UMKM misalnya. Kami banyak berfokus pada isu-isu utama seperti misalnya akses kepada sumber bahan baku, kemudian kapasitas SDM, pembiayaan, dan lain sebagainya. Padahal di luar itu mungkin masih banyak isu-isu lainnya yang kami apa namanya tidak belum tangkap gitu. Sementara dengan metode horizon scanning yang kami lakukan, ini kami mendapatkan pengalaman metode yang baru yang cukup unik menurut kami. Karena metode ini tadi mendorong kami untuk berpikir jauh ke masa depan, membayangkan apa yang dapat kita yang dapat kita lakukan saat ini untuk mengantisipasi perubahan di masa depan gitu. Dan bagaimana memikirkan kemungkinan itu bisa terefleksikan dari pengambilan keputusan yang kami buat nantinya. Nah, selanjutnya juga ini tadi ya lagi-lagi saya tekankan metodenya sangat sistematis dan terstruktur. Jadi banyak tahapan yang sudah kami jalani dari pengumpulan informasi tadi, kemudian interview dan juga FGD. Lalu ini juga yang yang terakhir juga ingin menekankan kembali bahwa foresight dan horizon scanning ini bukan bukan seperti forecast atau prediktif metode gitu. Jadi ini lebih baik kita lebih banyak mengeksplorasi mengenai faktor-faktor yang plausible yang yang mungkin akan sangat mungkin terjadi di masa depan khususnya ini yang masih biasanya belum ada di radar pengambil kebijakan gitu jadi kami merasa metode horizon scanning ini sangat inklusif memandang dari berbagai kacamata baik itu tadi dari politik kemudian hukum sosial ekonomi teknologi dan juga lingkungan sehingga ini menjadi sangat inklusif. Kemudian uh, ini yang terakhir, uh, keluaran dari horizon scanning ini adalah nanti tersusunnya laporan uh, yang kami uh, susun bersama dengan UN Global Post, bersama dengan Bapak Nas, kemudian nanti ada user manual juga yang akan bisa diakses oleh publik. Dan rencananya kami akan melaunching uh, horizon scanning report ini pada tanggal 12 Desember 2022 melalui uh, satu hari ya full day workshop yang uh, nantinya juga akan ada foresight klinik yang menghadirkan uh, para pakar foresight. Dan kami berharap nanti Bapak Ibu bisa bergabung dalam event ini dan memanfaatkan kesempatan untuk uh, berdiskusi mengenai potensi penggunaan uh, uh, strategi foresight dan horizon scanning uh, di masing-masing lingkungan unit kerja Bapak Ibu. Akhir kata, uh, saya ucapkan terima kasih atas perhatian Bapak Ibu rekan-rekan sekalian dan mohon maaf apabila ada kesalahan untuk perangan dalam penyampaian kami. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak Mbak Caca, uh, sangat uh, insightful. Terima kasih juga sudah share beberapa hal yang menjadi highlight dan bagaimana mungkin itu bisa saling komplement ya Mbak Caca dengan proses yang saat ini sudah berjalan di Bapak Nas sendiri untuk RPJPN dan juga ada beberapa pertanyaan Mbak Caca mungkin terkait bagaimana ini secara lebih lanjut bisa dimanfaatkan, nanti saya akan tanyakan ke Mbak Mariska juga baik Bapak Ibu dan rekan-rekan sekarang kita akan masuk ke sesi untuk diskusi sudah banyak sekali Pertanyaan yang masuk ke dalam uh, slido dan juga tadi ada yang masuk juga ke dalam Zoom yang akan saya tanyakan kepada para pembicara. So, distinguished speakers, there are a lot of questions that I would like to ask. Uh, Jadi ada pertanyaan yang ingin saya sampaikan kepada Anda supaya kita bisa mendapatkan diskusi lebih mendalam. Uh, Marius, uh, related to some examples that you already shared earlier. The one that is... Pertama, saya ingin bertanya kepada Pak Mario. 
where um, where the examples of real implementation of the concept preferably for developing countries like Indonesia so probably uh, the question is more like uh, we, we we heard the examples for example from EU but uh, there are question really looking forward for the context of developing countries maybe if you have any experience with that and the benefit of it whether uh, there are challenges as well so would like to hear more about uh, that examples and then the second one there is a questions as well um, I will um, direct this question to Minke. So if you could share the example where recommendation from um, foresight are used in combination with other methodologies. So is there any possibilities of combining one uh, with the other methodologies? So the, uh, that's the second questions. And then the third questions, I would like to give it to uh, Laura. Uh, there is a question. So from the Zoom, that is, Bapanas has a lot of planners because uh, this is a Ministry of Development Planning. Do you recommend uh, the Bapanas team to also have, for example, for horizon scanning, uh, scanners? Do you recommend Bapanas to acquire certain tools and dedicated processing units in terms of uh, Bapanas to also explore how to more uh, applying um, strategic foresight in a more systematic way. So that's a, uh, the question that is coming for, uh, to the Zoom. And then for Bachacha, there is also a, a question related to how actually Bapanas could implement this in more a systematic way. Mungkin Bachacha kalau boleh bisa explore lebih lanjut kira-kira dengan proses yang kemarin dilewati, kira-kira supaya prosesnya lebih bisa sistematik ke depan, day to day-nya kemarin mungkin sudah dirasakan kira-kira proses yang uh, perlu dilakukan itu seperti apa. So I think there are, uh, I'll stop there first for uh, five, uh, sorry, four different questions. There are more coming, but I'll I'll go first to Marius. Maybe if you could give more example, if you have any examples from developing countries, or if you would like to expand further about the examples from the South Africa or Oman that you shared earlier with us. So thank you for the question. Uh, very interesting. Um, I think I might cite two quick examples from South Africa and one from the the broader African region. Um, one of the very famous uh, foresight exercises from South Africa took place in 1990. Uh, between 1990 and 1994, when South Africa was going from apartheid to democracy, and we had a history of social and racial division in the country, and the, um, the Montfleur scenarios, which was a process by a group of stakeholders from across the, the racial uh, divides, across ideological divides, across political divides, created a set of scenarios of how South Africa might move from racial division and inequality towards democracy without uh, losing our fiscal, our, our, our public financial integrity. And so that was a very successful use of foresight to allow key decision makers, key leaders from across a spectrum of backgrounds to see the situation similarly. And uh, very famously in those scenarios, they use the, the image of the flight of the flamingos. Flamingos are birds that fly in a perfect formation. And they use the image of the flight of flamingos together as instead of the image of a ostrich, which sticks its head in the sand, um, where government pretends that there's no problem and sticks its head in the sand to communicate the need for South Africans to come together. And so in countries like Indonesia with very big uh, diversity, with um, diverse society, religious diversity, social and ethnic, uh, as well as economic differences, scenarios can be very powerful in bringing people together. Uh, the other one I might cite is work we did at, during the first half of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we collaborated with the Institute for Security Studies and the United Nations Development Program to think about the long-term impact of COVID on Africa. And so what we did is we convened 20 uh, groups of, of experts from 20 countries, and these are economists, political scientists, uh, civic activists in each country, and created these small dialogues in these countries. And then we connected all 20 uh, countries, groups of experts together in a virtual platform and had a conversation about what are the economic, social, uh, humanitarian consequences of COVID for Africa. So in that project, we used um, modeling software from the party center in the US to look at the quantitative impacts that COVID might have on the economy or on people's food security. And then we used the qualitative dialogue between the experts who understand the, the country at the grassroots 
to, to debate and, and engage with the quantitative data. And what that did is it created a very powerful set of policy insights about the types of impacts that COVID might have. And one of them, of course, was, was uh, increases in poverty and food insecurity to which governments then were able to respond with things like social grants. Um, what I will do is I'll share a link to some of that, with the, that work uh, with the organizers if you'd like to have a look at that material. Thank you so much. It's really interesting, Marius, to hear uh, the examples of that too, about the, about the, uh, the cases that you shared earlier. Just want to expand a bit of based from those two examples, how do they how do, did they found it different with the one that they usually uh, use in terms of making the policy and then responding to different uh, challenges that they found in terms of the diversity as well as for the uh, combination of qualitative and quantitative, how did they find it different with the, uh, the usual method that they use? So that's a very interesting question. Um, I think in the case of Montfleur, where you had people from different ideological backgrounds and racial and historical backgrounds coming together, the real shift was that instead of those individuals thinking about the future limited by their own ideology, their own history, their own identity, what they were able to do is to envision a future which is a shared future in which diverse ideologies and histories can coexist, which is a very powerful shift in the mindset of the participants. And so very often when we do foresight, we say to people, the process is the product. When you do foresight, yes, we'll write a report. Yes, we'll print it with a nice cover. But the report, the foresight report is not the product. It's the process that's the product because it's during the process that people have an aha moment or they have a, they have a shift in their thinking or their attitude in that environment. And then on the, on the impact of COVID in Africa, policymakers are very good at looking at the quantitative data that is historic and the hindsight. And so the real magic, if I can call it that, or the surprise of foresight is that it allows policymakers to become sensitized to policy issues that have not yet become policy issues. So they were able to understand that food insecurity is going to become a social crisis on the back of a health crisis because of an economic shock in the form of lockdown. And so that ability to shift their thinking into the anticipation space instead of the historical space, I think was the key difference. It's great. Thank you for sharing that. So the process is actually the product, not the product. Uh, the, the report is not the product itself. So it's interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Minka as well uh, uh, to, to, for you to also respond to the question that I mentioned earlier, whether uh, there is a um, recommendation how the foresight is used in combination with other methodologies, which Marius actually already started with uh, uh, giving the example of uh, the one in the Africa. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Daisy and Mary. It's so inspiring to hear. And I think this is actually what we also learned during this Horizon Scan, right? It's definitely not about the, the, the end report that we're working on now, but we've learned so much throughout this entire um, uh, process with Papa together to really contextualize everything that we've learned and kind of uh, also contextualize the, the process itself. So um, yes, and I think, Daisy, there's so much to learn still for us as UN Global Pots to kind of combine all those methods, right? We have the, the, the quintet of change from the from our common agenda is highlighting not only strategic foresight, so behavioral science and data science. We we should not treat them as like separate silos and separate methodologies, but we should kind of see how those different the, the different strengths of these methods can actually uh, contribute to the to the bigger picture. But it's it's not an easy job, right? And I think there's often kind of a false uh like digital me between forecasting and and foresight where we we are forecasting is it's it's different but i think they're both complementary and they they should be like forecasting is more about you know data and trend analysis and it that helps us to understand the yeah the, the trends right so then it kind of the emerging issues but it's not enough it should not stop there and i think that realization that you need foresight to really explore in a wider sense, what, what could be the potentially emerging issues and how could the system really evolve? So we need horizon scanning and we need kind of the driver and, and system mapping and we need to develop scenarios. And so seeing this constantly as and versus forecasting versus foresight is not really helpful. 
I think we could, should kind of leverage the strength of both both approaches, and that's uh, that that's a learning journey, and and not only for us, I think for the broader foresight community. Um, but um, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's make an effort to kind of uh, see how we can. Thank you, do Minka. That. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that the combination is of course needed um, uh, in com in combining different methods. Um, it's not like one the other way around or just versus, but it's actually how we combine that as as kind of like a process to complement in each other. So Laurent, uh, the one the question that I share uh, uh, mentioned earlier with you about the how Bapanas is actually uh, consists of different planners with the one that uh, we are, um, they're planning to incorporate strategic foresight into the process of planning. How do you recommend uh, Bapanas can, can incorporate this process? Um, do we need uh, 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 um, a human resources? Like, do we need a specific unit? So how, how is it in comparing with the EU context, for example, what do we need in terms of applying? Thanks for, for this question. Um, it's a very difficult question. Um, so if I reflect back on, on our own reality, first I have to say that we do horizon scanning. We have a, a routine exercise, you know, which is uh, embedded in our operation. And I think that this is actually illustrating very much the dual nature of our, our, our promotion of the user foresight across our organization. Uh, so yes, and you've seen with, with the for history that I've given you this morning, um, that we have specifically institutionalized units of people who are actually practicing foresight. But it is very important to actually spread the foresight literacy beyond that and to really spread this culture, uh, you know, in, in wherever people work, you know. And for horizon scanning, for example, we have developed a network of what we call horizon scanners, you know, who collect information for us and who are invited regularly to sense-making sessions, you know, to analyze the results. And that helps spread this understanding of foresight and this foresight culture across the organization. So that's one thing. Another thing is, you know, in the EU we've developed this better regulation practice. So we try to always improve our capacity to do policy making. And so for this, we've developed a toolbox. And recently, for last year, or two years ago now, uh, actually managed to include foresight in the toolbox. So foresight is officially recognized as one of the methods that people can and have to use to do better policy making. And in particular, we are using scenarios to perform what we call ex ante impact assessment. So when we develop a policy, we want to you know try to assess you know what's the likely impact of that policy. And traditionally people do forecasts to do that. They use economic models and they just make it to numbers. Uh, and, and people discovered that this is not enough. And so we are starting to use scenarios to help people understand more completely in a more holistic manner uh, what potential future impacts of that policy could be and what challenges could be found to implement these policies. And we start to use foresight to, to do this kind of thing. And so, and the third thing is, uh, we are also engaged as a foresight unit in training, in providing foresight training to our colleagues from across different services of the Even though it's not going to make them foresight experts because their job is not to do foresight, at least they will know how to use the results of foresight. And they will also understand when they need to call on foresight to help them in their work. That's very important to, to promote this culture across the organization. So, so it's a two strand approach. One is, yes, we need a few units with a few people who actually are experts in foresight and can do foresight projects. But we need to also spread the word, spread that culture across the organization so that the people involved in the policy making work can actually know how to call on the foresight experts to actually do foresight for them and to make it useful. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren. I, I took a note about uh, that kind of thing. And I also remembered that 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 was also being mentioned by Marius, just thinking about the overall ecosystems that needs to be in place, yeah. not only kind of like um, having that kind of unit, but really uh, go beyond just one unit, but thinking about the more ecosystems that needs to be in place for the for the strategic foresight to be uh, applied. That comes to the next questions that I asked to uh, Mariska with the experience that you already have with horizon scanning, for example. Uh, how do you think Chacha Bapanas could 
apply in more systematic way if they would like to incorporate uh, the strategic foresight into their daily to day basis. Mbak Desi, um, dari pengalaman kami melakukan uh, strategi for saat ini, um, sebenarnya yang paling pertama mungkin bisa kita terapkan dalam pikiran itu. We can actually implement practically is the idea that this is feasible across all sectors. We can apply this across all sectors. So based on our collaboration with uh, Post Lab, I know that the use case is specifically for MS. Uh, apa namanya uh, uh, lintas sektor di Bapenas begitu. Uh, kemudian yang uh, mungkin perlu dipersiapkan. Bapenas is handling. But also what we need to prepare is this, the efforts and commitment uh, in terms of uh, resources, the people, and also time. So once we have the, uh, these resources, because this is a process that is quite exhausted from uh, exhausted from April all the way to December. So making sure that you can you can make a structured uh, schedule or time to do it in the midst of our activities. As for the question of whether we need a separate unit in Bapanas or not, I think what really is needed is just the sm just uh, how to replicate all the learnings that we have from uh, different exercises that we do. So once again, commitment and time, having that time is, is, is really, really necessary because this is something new. I know that we're all learning and we do need a strong guidelines from the experts on how to do this because we begin from training, we begin from guided workshops and each of these workshops, I like how we have the guides on what is the purpose of what we're doing here, what are we going to do, and that, that is very, very nice. Thank you very much, Chacha. And just to continue on what Chacha mentioned and also Lohang mentioned earlier, you need mengintegrasi strategic foresight ini ke dalam policy planning. Dan kebetulan dari project ini yang saat ini kami sedang kerjakan dengan Direktorat PUKMK akan ada toolkit yang akan available mudah-mudahan Bapak Ibu bisa akses di bulan Desember bersamaan dengan launching karena toolkit itu mudah-mudahan dapat membantu at least untuk proses horizon scanning itu seperti apa so that you get to know hands on what horizon scanning is so we have uh... maybe I'll go again to uh, Marius if that's okay there is a question you mentioned earlier in your presentation that it's important to have that ecosystem and then, then uh, that literacy about what is foresight and how to integrate, etc. Um, there is a question, what will happen when foresight was developed with a lack of capability and what is actually needed for us to uh, starting implementing that foresight? Uh, just to clarify quickly, was the question, what will happen when that capability has been developed? What will that look like? So when the capability is, is, is still lacking, in terms of when they are starting about doing that foresight? So I think that there is a process. One has to accept that anytime you're bringing a new technical competence into an institution, that in and of itself will be a process. Um, and you may need to rely on partners and supporters outside of the institution to bring those skills and capabilities into the institution. Um, but ideally, over time, what will happen is individuals and then as uh, Lorena also has explained, the processes themselves and the institutional structures will begin to adopt and embed foresight until foresight becomes a uh, normal everyday practice within that institution. Maybe one other thought to add is there is the risk, you know, when, we, when we're talking about formal government planning, someone in the chat also said, formal government planning is really about politics. And politics is really about legitimacy. And so there is a risk as we fail to integrate foresight, if we fail to develop the competencies for foresight. What tends to happen over time is our plans become less relevant and less impactful. As Minka's uh, graphic on uh, the rate of change also showed, the uh, relevance gap emerges. And the real risk of that is that our institutions then lose legitimacy. And we see this around the world where there's a lack of trust in institutions. And so foresight is not only solving the ability of the institutions to look ahead. They're also solving or working on the ability of the institutions to build legitimacy and participation with the population or the people that those institutions represent. Thank you so much. That's also addressing the further questions that I would like to ask with you because, you know, uh, as, as, as Pa Kyril, 
mentioned in the chat box that is actually a political process and thinking about how that can be built as kind of like a legitimacy is, is, is the one that we need to take account as well. Um, I'll still have a couple of questions. I would like to ask when you already mentioned about the, possi uh, the possible futures, there are a couple of scenarios that need to be made. There is a question uh, about how do you prioritize among several possible futures? Do we need to select all scenarios or how do you actually prioritize them? I will open whether Laurent, uh, Minke or Marius or Bajaja would like to answer about this. Probably, uh, Minko, would you like to, or Laurent? I can go first, and I think Laurent also muted this up. It's not maybe really necessary about prioritizing a certain scenario. That's not really the, the purpose of doing a scenario exercise. Uh, so the, really the purpose of doing a scenario exercise is that you kind of, you first, what you do prioritize is kind of what, is really for the topic that we are addressing, for example, MSME, what are like the key uncertainties for this future, right? For the future of MSME. So you kind of want to understand that a bit better. That's something you prioritize, but then building upon that, you, you draft scenarios. Uh, but the purpose of doing those scenarios is that you want to test, for example, the policies and the strategies that you have in place. Are they still valid in those world, worlds? Are they still kind of, uh, hold the test of the future, right? And if if maybe your policy or your strategy works in one scenario but fails in the other three or four, then you might want to rethink your 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 uh, policy there because then it's not really robust. If it works across the different scenarios that you've outlined, then it's it's probably a, a good way to proceed. So that's maybe it that the uh, as the same basically as foresight it's really about the process it's also about scenario thinking it's not it's not about the scenarios in as an end in themselves it's kind of what you do with it it's a, it's a tool to kind of make you think about the about the future maybe now I'm over to Laurent who has probably a lot of experience in the EU context with do, doing scenarios uh, thanks a lot Minka no I agree completely with what with what you, you said and uh, I was going to say something very similar and actually this is a the core of what will act under impact assessment, you know, which is a formal step in the policy making process, where we actually use scenarios exactly to do what you said. You know, we stress test the policy, you know, whether the policy is going to survive across different kinds of scenarios to see whether it's robust moving forward towards the future. And then also uh, back to, to what Marius was saying earlier, you know, the, the process is very important. And how inclusive the process is, is also very important. It is very often what we see in the commission, but I think it's not typical of the commission. It happens in many governments. You know, people tend to consult the usual culprit. You know, it's always the same stakeholders that the government consults. You know, it's an industry association, it's, you know, whatever. You know, you have a few set people or, or organizations that are always consulted about policy initiatives, but this is not complete enough. So very often, there's a whole range of stakeholders which is forgotten. That's one point. And the second point is that in the standard consultation processes, people are consulted one by one. And so foresight allows to be engaging with all of them, plus the non-classic culprits, I would say. So, so you enlarge the capacity to engage with people. And when you engage with them all at the same time, which allows you to generate this collective intelligence that you don't have if you just you know, consult them one by one. So, so the foresight process there is really essential. And I really support what Marius was saying earlier, saying that the, the important is not so much the Sandy report at the end, even though we always produce one, but it's more what happens on the way towards the report. Thank you so much, Minka and Laurent, for sharing that. So again, the emphasis on the process, and it's not about like choosing one another, but literally thinking about how we actually considered everything into all the process that we have. Um, unfortunately, we uh, run out of the time, um, but I would like to again say thank you to all the distinguished speakers for sharing with us today. We learned a lot from all of you. Hopefully, we can still. Uh, go in touch because Bapanas is really interested how to incorporate um, strategic foresight into their policy planning. So again, thank you very much for all the speakers, for all your time and then the presentations. Um, so for the next one on the agenda, we have uh, just for re recapping everything with what we have learned today, 
I will go to Messi Angelina, our social systems lead from Postlab Jakarta. Mbak Messi, silakan. Terima kasih Desi dan terima kasih juga untuk semua pembicara untuk diskusi yang sangat menarik pada siang hari ini. Saya ingin berbagi pada Bapak Ibu sekalian beberapa poin yang saya refleksikan ketika mendengarkan paparan yang begitu menarik dari pembicara-pembicara kita. Yang pertama, walaupun strategic foresight mungkin sebagai sebuah terminologi sudah tidak asing lagi bagi para perencana, bagi orang jadi isu pembangunan, yang saya betul-betul tangkap tadi ada beberapa hal. Yang pertama, Fungsinya strategic foresight ini adalah sebagai wake up call sebetulnya. Kita memang sebagai perencana, sebagai orang yang bekerja di isu pembangunan, sebagai bagian dari PBB, kita banyak sekali bergantung pada data yang ada di masa lalu, pola dari hasil riset, tapi seperti yang pembicara-pembicara kita ingatkan, pola ini bisa berubah karena rate perubahan jauh lebih cepat, jauh lebih pesat dibandingkan apa yang terjadi sebelumnya. Jadi kita memang perlu mengantisipasi, melihat sinyal perubahan, dan membentuk anticipate signals and to uh, build and shape our vision so that we can ensure development for the better. Pun terminologi strategic foresight sepertinya cukup umum dan sering didengar, sebenarnya proses ini adalah proses yang sistematis dan terstruktur. Tadi banyak contoh yang kita sudah dengar tentang bagaimana proses ini bisa dilakukan dengan sistematis dan juga berbagai metodologi dan juga alat yang bisa kita gunakan untuk proses ini. Tapi walaupun ini adalah metode yang sistematis dan terstruktur, hal lain yang saya refleksikan adalah bahwa foresight ini bukan hanya menjadi sesuatu yang dimiliki atau bisa dilakukan oleh pakar-pakarnya. Kepakaran memang penting, dan seperti yang tadi disampaikan oleh Mbak Mariska dari Mbak Penas, memang kita memerlukan pakar-pakar foresight untuk bisa membimbing orang-orang yang mungkin baru belajar atau memfamiliarkan dirinya dengan metode ini untuk bisa melakukannya. Tapi sebetulnya, inti dan kunci dari proses strategic foresight seperti yang disampaikan pembicara tadi, ada di yang saya sebut sebagai collective intelligence, gitu, atau kecerdasan kolektif, kecerdasan bersama. Strategic foresight yang bagus bukan sesuatu yang dilakukan oleh seorang ahli di luar sana yang kemudian kita dapat hasilnya berupa report, berupa video, sesuatu yang di-launch, tapi strategic foresight adalah proses bersama. Proses di mana kita semua bisa membangun otot gitu ya, otot kita untuk mengerjakan strategic foresight gitu. Jadi ini hal yang penting untuk kita ingat bersama bahwa pendekatan untuk melakukan strategic foresight bukan hanya bergantung pada kepakaran, tapi bagaimana kita bisa benar-benar bekerja bersama, ber- menjangkau stakeholder yang ada di luar comfort zone kita, seperti yang tadi disebutkan oleh Mbak Mariska juga, bagaimana kita bisa lebih inklusif, melibatkan orang muda, kelompok yang termarginalkan, orang yang selama ini tidak dilibatkan dalam proses perencanaan, proses strategi foresight bisa membantu kita untuk lebih bekerja sama dengan kelompok-kelompok yang selama ini mungkin tertinggal dari proses perencanaan. Dan yang kedua, seperti yang dibahas tadi ketika kita diskusi dan dari Q&A, perencanaan juga proses yang politis. Jadi memang penting untuk bersama-sama mendiskusikan strategic foresight dan insight yang didapatkan dari proses ini, supaya jadi punya legitimasi dan kita bisa sama-sama memikirkan tindakan apa yang bisa diambil, kebijakan apa yang bisa dibentuk, dan bagaimana kita bisa menuju visi yang lebih inklusif dan lebih resilient untuk negara kita Indonesia. Jadi kurang lebih itu beberapa refleksi yang saya dapatkan dan ingin saya sampaikan untuk merangkum diskusi kita hari ini. Selanjutnya saya ingin juga menyampaikan bahwa Pulse Jakarta dan keluarga besar UN Global Pulse sangat mengapresiasi ketertarikan dan juga upaya Bapenas untuk berpikir lebih antisipatif untuk membentuk rencana pembangunan jangka panjang di Indonesia. Selain inisiatif yang kita kerjakan bersama dengan Direktorat PUKMK, Kami juga sering mendengar dari rekan-rekan Mbak Penas tentang bagaimana ada proses senario planning yang sedang berjalan dan lain-lain. Pertanyaannya mungkin sekarang seperti yang tadi ditanyakan juga ketika di bagian Q&A, bagaimana proses ini bisa bergerak dari mungkin unit atau bagian tertentu menjadi sesuatu yang dikembangkan bersama dan diterapkan lebih sistematis di dalam Mbak Penas. Apabila rekan-rekan Mbak Penas tertarik untuk mengeksplorasi ini lebih lanjut, keluarga besar UN Global Pulse akan dengan senang hati melanjutkan kemitraan dan mengeksplorasinya bersama dengan rekan-rekan Mbak Penas. Demikian dari saya, terima kasih.
Terima kasih banyak Mbak Mesi atas refleksi dan juga uh, rangkuman dari diskusi kita hari ini. Uh, lagi-lagi terkait dengan proses itu yang sudah kita dengar bersama, bagaimana kita sebagai uh, secara kolektif berproses untuk melihat bagaimana forset kemudian bisa diimplementasikan dan juga untuk menjadi sebuah legitimasi. Terima kasih banyak sekali lagi Mbak Mesi dan juga tadi kepada para speaker yang sudah menyampaikan um, paparannya kepada kami. Dan sekali lagi saya juga mengucapkan terima kasih kepada para uh, pejabat, Bapak, Ibu, rekan-rekan dari lingkungan di Bapenas atas um, waktunya yang sudah mendengarkan uh, webinar ini dari awal hingga akhir. Sebelum menutup, saya akan mempersilahkan Pak uh, Muhammad Irfan Saleh, PLT Kepala Kabus Datin Renbang uh, Bapenas untuk bisa menyampaikan closing remarks-nya. Kepada Pak Irfan, kami persilahkan. Terima kasih, Bu Desi. Yang terhormat, Pak, Pak Asmen. Distinguished speakers, Ibu Mika, Pak Lauren, Pak Marius, Mbak Caca. Ini uh, terima kasih sekali sore ini kita sudah banyak uh, belajar dan uh, sharing mengenai beberapa hal yang terkait strategic foresight untuk policy planning. Uh, kami juga uh, sangat bangga bahwa hari ini kita uh, juga uh, kegiatan ini dihadiri banyak sekali uh, senior di Bapenas dan teman-teman dari seluruh uh, unit kerja dan mungkin uh, bisa banyak sekali pelajaran yang bisa kita ambil dan tadi excellent summary dari Mbak Messi sebagai penutup uh, saya pertama-tama untuk penutup ini uh, mengucapkan terima kasih banyak kepada UN Global Pulse terutama teman-teman dari Pulse Lab Jakarta dan uh, Pulse Lab dari Finland atas uh, fasilitasinya dalam proses ini dan terutama pada uh, para pembicara yang sudah hadir kita sadar bahwa memang untuk eh, ketidakpastian di masa depan kita masih sangat banyak dan saya pikir strategi for saat ini bisa jadi satu hal yang eh, tools yang bisa kita gunakan terutama di Bapenas untuk melihat skenario-skenario yang muncul di masa mendatang. Saya pikir kalau kata kuncinya mungkin satu hal yang bisa saya angkat juga adalah the more the merrier gitu ya artinya ketika kita bersama-sama membuat sesuatu langkah yang sistematis dan terstruktur harusnya harapan kita bahwa ke depan kita bisa lebih optimis untuk memperoleh sesuatu dari pembelajaran kita selama ini teman-teman di eh, Bapenas eh, di Direktorat PUKMK dengan Pulse Lab Jakarta eh, kami sebagai fasilitator dalam kegiatan ini juga eh, banyak hal yang sudah kita pelajari bersama di forum juga ada Pak Dading terima kasih banyak Pak fasilitasinya dan Mbak Caca, dan mudah-mudahan nanti uh, ketika hasil kemitraan ini kita luncurkan uh, pada bulan Desember, kita juga bisa uh, bersama-sama di Bapenas untuk mulai mencoba menggunakan pendekatan seperti ini dalam proses-proses kita selanjutnya. Saya pikir uh, fasilitator dan bagaimana proses ini bisa dimoderasi dengan baik, itu satu hal yang perlu juga kita siapkan dengan uh, baik, dengan Uh, memilih beberapa mungkin uh, pihak yang terlibat dalam proses penyusunan RPJP. Uh, hari ini ada Pak Heri Labdini sebagai ketua dari tim RPJP tersebut. Mudah-mudahan event hari ini bisa banyak juga uh, memberikan masukan terhadap proses tersebut. Dan sekali lagi untuk uh, hari ini kita kegiatannya uh, mudah-mudahan banyak sekali manfaatnya. Bahan yang disampaikan juga sudah di-share. Nah, semoga bisa bermanfaat bagi kita semua. Pak Petra, terima kasih teman-teman dari Pulse Rep Jakarta. Saya pikir itu yang dari sambutan yang bisa saya sampaikan sebagai penutup. Sampai ketemu lagi di sesi-sesi kita berikutnya. Dan mudah-mudahan proses ini bisa kita lanjutkan dalam proses penyusunan kita, penyusunan perencanaan di Bapenas. Terima kasih, Bu Desi. Dari saya, saya sekian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore. Baik Pak Irfan, terima kasih banyak atas kata penutupnya. Saya kira sudah banyak direkap tadi oleh uh, Pak Irfan juga bagaimana mudah-mudahan ini bisa terus uh, menjadi manfaat bagi uh, Mbak Penas. Dengan senang hati seperti yang uh, Mbak Mesi tadi sampaikan, jika ada ke depan kita ingin diskusi terkait dengan strategic foresight, dengan senang hati Yuan Global Pass akan berdiskusi dan juga sekedar mengingatkan kembali tadi yang sudah disampaikan Mbak Caca di awal. Di tanggal 12 Desember kami akan launching report The Future of MSMEs in Indonesia, 
dan di situ juga kita akan ada beberapa klinik atau workshop yang akan terbuka untuk Bapak Ibu dan rekan-rekan ikuti karena di situ kita akan mengeksplorasi secara lebih lanjut bagaimana menggunakan metode-metode foresight untuk perencanaan kebijakan ataupun pembangunan. Uh, akhir kata saya ucapkan kembali terima kasih kepada para pembicara. Thank you again for distinguished speakers. Terima kasih banyak kepada Bapak Ibu uh, dari Bapenas tadi sudah banyak uh, seperti yang disebutkan yang juga gabung ada Pak Deputi, Pak Direktur dan juga para pejabat staf ahli yang uh, ikut hadir berdiskusi bersama-sama dengan kami. Uh, mohon maaf apabila ada kekurangan dalam pelaksanaan webinar ini dan dengan demikian kami tutup webinarnya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Selamat sore semua. Teman-teman dari Divet juga terima kasih sudah ikut. Oh betul, terima kasih. Terima kasih semua.